thank you for joining us to the UTS Media Salon, the journalist and the scholar on the topic imagination, AI and news. My name is Christine Carney and I'm a journalist and lecturer in digital journalism here at the University of Technology, Sydney in the School of Communication in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences. The aim of the salon is to bring together and spark global conversations between media professionals and academics, writers, policymakers, students, and others on global media issues, on topics both broad and big picture, or sometimes more niche. And we are delighted today to have speaking with us Professor Mark Doiser and lead data scientist at The Guardian, Anna Vicens. But before I introduce them further, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aurora Nation upon whose ancestral lands our city campus is situated. We pay respects to elders past, present and emerging. They are the traditional custodians of knowledge for these ancestral lands. This session is being recorded for teaching and learning purposes and will take approximately about 45 minutes. We will have a discussion for 30 minutes and then take questions from our audience for about 15 minutes. So to the audience, please use the Q&A function, not the chat function, but the Q&A box to ask your questions. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as possible and you may post a question at any time. And if you're a social media person, whether you are still on Twitter or perhaps you are using another platform, feel free to use the hashtag UTS Media Salon. Now, I'm most excited to properly introduce our uh, journalist and scholar for today. Mark Doiser is a professor of media studies at the University of Amsterdam's Faculty of Humanities. Mark has held honorary appointments at the Faculty of Journalism at Lomonosov, Moscow State University, Russia, the School of Communication of, uh, here at, the, at UTS in Sydney, and the Department of Communication and Media Studies of Northumbria University in the UK. Publications of his work include over 100 papers in academic journals and 12 books. Before that, he worked as a journalist and academic in the United States, Germany and South Africa. He is also the bass player and a singer of Skin Flower, which was, I think I've got that right, Mark, which is a punk band. And Mark, I believe you have successfully touched down just a couple of hours ago in Perth. I know you're making a big tour of Australia, so welcome and I hope you've been able to unpack. Just about, thanks, Christine. <laughs> and Anna, to Anna, Anna Vicenz is a physicist by trade, but has spent nearly all her career in media, first as a journalist and then as a, as a data scientist. Anna leads a team of data scientists at the UK-based Guardian News and Media. Previously, she worked at the BBC, where in 2007, she received an award for best producer in recognition of success in building new audiences and developing an effective social media strategy. In 2015, Anna decided to change her career and become a data scientist. Anna's prime interest is natural language processing, but she also worked on audience segmentation and propensity modeling. And Anna, I know it's early in the morning from where you are joining from in London. So a special thank you for you for joining us at this early hour. How is London this morning? Uh, very cold, <laughs> but I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> I had my coffee, so I should be fine. <laughs> okay, brilliant. Well, well, it's always good to get going on a cold London morning with some coffee. Um, so let's get going with this panel. Uh, the panel was inspired actually by Mark Doyce's recent co-authored essay, Imagination, Algorithms and News, Developing AI Literacy for Journalism. It highlights the importance of lifting artificial intelligence literacy in journalism, acknowledges the long history of journalism and technology interdependence, and calls for shifting the perspective from reacting to the inev inevitability of AI to creating imaginative pro, uh, approaches with the help of AI that serves the human journalist and public aims of journalism. Uh, this panel is actually just one of many discussions taking place around the globe, giving an introduction to and discussion of journalism and AI, notably also by, I have to say, LSE's Charlie Beckett, who Mark co-authored the paper with, and its Journalism AI Initiative. 
So uh, let's start with something the two of you have in common, how you got to be here today, sharing thoughts on tonight's topic, Imagine, Imagination AI News. Mark, you've written about all sorts of media issues in your lengthy 25 year career in academia. And Anna, even though, as your bio says, you are a physicist by trade, you were a journalist before taking a leap into the world of data scientists, science, several years ago. So what, what got you both jumping into or thinking about this space? And Mark, we might start with you and then go to Anna. Um, well, for, first of all, thanks so much for organizing this and, and for, for having me, uh, Christine, uh, having me back, I would almost say. Um, and 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 look for me the, the the issue with AI and journalism is part of a of a of a much broader uh, theme that I've been confronted with both as a journalist uh, and and this is Grandpa speaking. I remember when I studied to be a journalist, we had typewriters. <laughs> Only in the second or third year of our program, we got computers if I remember correctly, uh, way back in the 80s. Um, but the, the notion of, of digital transformation, broadly conceived, but, but beyond that, the, the, the way the, in the history of journalism, the, the, the profession, the industry has responded to technological changes. And you see sort of a recurring pattern, right? Is that, that the, the technology is often seen as something that happens to journalism from the outside, like a comet hurtling towards Earth that you now have to respond to, which leads to some people saying, I don't want to know about it. Other people saying, this is the best thing ever. And a huge block in the middle is like, I don't know. And um, and then very fairly quickly the response, oh, the technology can now do the, the banal, the mundane stuff, and we can focus on what makes journalism great, you know, the, the real investigations, the, 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 the beautiful storytelling and those kind of things. And that's, that was the response to, you know, the rise of, of radio as a mass medium in the 1930s. It was the response to the rise of commercial television in the 60s and 70s. It was the, the uh, sorry, the 80s. The, the, and then later on in the 90s, the rise of the, uh, the introduction of the World Wide Web. So you get the, the same discussions repeating. And you see those same discussions now in the, in the realm of AI as well. So... On the one hand, an important discussion, and the other hand, I wonder if we are cons consistently missing all kinds of really imaginative and creative opportunities, and the kind of opportunities that Anna is, is doing in her work, uh, um, um, like really using this space uh, for 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 uh, different type uh, different ways of doing journalism, rather than fretting about what we lose or what we gain. So that's my turn, probably. <laughs> so I also, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you for having me um, as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it's interesting. Um, you know, when, before I actually went to, you know, to study um, uh, at the uni, I had a gap year and I worked uh, in one like tech, tech institutions or something like this and we had punch cards, right? So <laughs> if, if anyone remembers you know, how, how they looked, <laughs> So if you and I'm, you know, I don't consider myself yet to be you know, too old, but uh, it just shows how <laughs> everything uh, can change, you know, very, very quickly. And uh, it's just amazing how, um, you know, even the media, right, and uh, what used to be like a very, very classic, uh, like the Guardian, right, just a newspaper. Uh, but uh, my my experience working in the newsroom there. It's just like the, one of the most uh, advanced uh, digital digital uh, kind of you know publishers. So we we actually we move very quickly and we learn you know how to adapt etc. You know very very quickly. But it might be uh, quite frustrating, right? And uh, so changes um, sometimes happen quicker than we 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 kind of we are able to digest. <laughs> so my personal journey. Um, was very, I, I don't think that, I have to say, you know, I always was nostalgic about science. I, you know, uh, that wasn't my, um, 
you know, it wasn't my decision. It was I, I mostly kind of, you know, was forced to do something else, but not science. So when I, when I, uh, you know, uh, when I met this opportunity, uh, when I started doing some analytics for, uh, like product management and you know project management, etc., that was it, um, you know, with uh, well, with the BBC, I just realized that we have so much data. But you know all this data, we we basically you know we just we we didn't use it that time. Um, so it was just sitting there in a very bad shape and form, uh, etc. And I thought that well, we have so many opportunities there, um, and we really re we really need to transform the newsroom to be data informed at least. You know, we are, I'm not even talking about AI, but just kind of you know looking at the data and trying to understand the content that you create uh, your audiences, you know, via this data, et cetera. That was a huge opportunity, actually. And I have to say that we are doing much, much better. But um, there are so many small newsrooms around the world, uh, you know, which just struggle even, even to collect this data, right? So when, when when we talk about AI and you know all these opportunities, um, you know, sometimes it's just, uh, yeah, it's very, far-fetched for many, many journalists around the world. Um, so we are very fortunate uh, to have means and resources to do something about it. But uh, there is a huge divide, I think, here as well. So that's that's my <laughs> my journey. You're so right, Anna, because of course in newsrooms, there's often not enough time to even, we so the deadlines are so, so much pressure there that we don't have enough time to even think about it um which is of course the purpose of today uh, these panels such as today but um i'm going to be a bit wonky here and, and read a little bit out of your paper mark um and i'm going to quote from it now uh in the paper you identified a huge and you've been talking about this already but a huge ai knowledge deficit within the news industry both in terms of general understanding and specialist expertise Although this deficit is being addressed, we signal a danger in that it is not changing fast enough, and Anna, you were just talking a little bit about that, to reduce the risk of falling behind, exacerbating digital inequalities and increasing the real danger of journalism being captured by technology and the tech sector, rather than recognising its history as interdependent with a range of technologies, including data, algorithms and computational thinking and being able to creatively and ethically use machines to be better at delivering upon its public promise, journalism's public promise. Um, so I guess just sticking to the bigger picture here, what do you both think is the danger for journalism and newsrooms uh, not moving fast enough adapting, adapting to uh, tech changes? Of course, I'm also thinking about, you know, um, with the rise of the internet and the slow pace that newsrooms had uh, adapting to online um yeah what what lessons can we learn from that and um i guess you know mark we might start with you since i've quoted from the paper <laughs> yeah no but, well look a, a, a journalist who's who's listening to this or is reading something like that or a journalism student or or a journalism scholar would be forgiven if they if what they hear in these kind of words is well, does that mean that I now have to learn statistics or that now every journalist has to be good at programming or like and 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 all of that and and that is certainly not what 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 Charlie and I are suggesting here. Um, in fact, you know, you, you were kindly referencing the fact that I've now been in academia for 25 years, which is rather um, depressing <laughs> and also very exciting. <laughs> Uh, but but if there's one thing I've learned from studying journalism and technological slash digital transformation in all that time, both in what happened, what has happened in that time, as well as looking back in the history of journalism, is that technolo technological change in journalism is a cultural phenomenon. So it's not about journalists becoming fantastic at some at stuff with computers or software or or or, or uh, SPSS or R or, or or Excel, God forbid, but it it is about uh, developing uh, a discourse around this, uh, um, 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 appreciating the different ways in which uh, this new technological thing that's happening now. Now we're talking about AI. Um, um, a couple of years ago, we talked about data a couple of years before, right? There's always something. Um, 
but to, to appreciate that this is a cultural thing first and foremost and that it is about um and it reproduces certain expectations that we attribute to technology right like like if technology is often assumed to be better or more perfect than humans right uh, and and everything we know about algorithms and 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 ai and everything suggests that they are at at least as as flawed as we are at at, at doing stuff right uh, they reproduce the very uh, uh, inequalities and nonsense and biases that all of us have and and i find that uh, comforting almost yeah of course we have to be critical and those are problems to be solved but it's comforting to know that ah again we are reminded that this new technology this new fangled thing this device this whatever is not going to replace journalism it's not going to destroy it it's not going to make it better it's it's just a thing that we are in relation with inevitably because we are journalists so th th i think that for me is a real key uh, behind a statement like that and uh, and and beyond that is to also prevent knee-jerk responses to technological change like uh, uh you know this is for the better or this is for the worse or this will free us up to do the things that we uh, you know are supposed to be doing it's like no you still have to do mundane everyday things as a reporter even if you outsource some text writing to to ai uh, um, uh programs like you know and we as professors christine we are now faced with in the future, we can't really assign students to write essays anymore because with open AI chat uh, and, and text writing applications, they, they can submit perfect essays. <laughs> so, so we have to come up with other ways of, of interacting and assessing our students. And, and you know, that's fun. And, 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 and I hope journalists see this kind of stuff like that too. Thanks for reminding us of that, Mark. It's a great future. That... <laughs> but Anna, what, what do you think? I mean, a, a, journal, a, a newsroom's uh, adapting fast enough, um, you know. Yeah, it's, uh, I think that, oh, you know, all these essays uh, will be pretty similar, right? So you, <laughs> you will be able to spot this <laughs> pretty quickly. And we also, we, we probably need uh, some sort of um, another algorithm uh, detecting this stuff uh, for, for the universities. <laughs> um, no, but uh, it's, yeah, it's hard uh, because we are not uh, big tech companies. And honestly, you know, uh, AI is expensive. It's very tricky. Uh, it needs a lot of investment. And it's, it's not only about money. It's uh, investing in uh, skills. Um, and it's also investing in uh, your overall kind of, you know, big, big strategy, uh, because it's not only about hiring a couple of data scientists, you know, it's, it's not about this. If you really want to create some, uh, you know, proper data solutions for the newsroom, you need a lot of, you know, more than just this, right? <laughs> you need data engineers, you know, you need proper tech support, uh, but the the most important thing for for the newsroom, and I think that this is where we really uh, need to change this culture and uh, kind of you know educate uh, our newsrooms a little bit more about AI and you know what's possible, what's not possible, because honestly, with all this hype around uh, text generation, you know GPT three, four, ten, fifteen, whatever comes next. Uh, I also agree with Mark, it's not going to replace journalists. Um, and we can have the whole discussion about, you know, how these models work and, you know, and why, why not, et cetera. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we are really um, kind of nervous and probably will never do something 100% uh, automated. Uh, you know, whatever we build uh, for our newsroom, we always try to have some sort of humans in the loop. And to have these humans in the loop, uh, we need humans, <laughs> you know, journalists, <laughs> really understanding what's going on, right? So, and I'm not, again, you know, I'm not talking about statistics and, you know, how this algorithm works, etc. But it's just this uh, very very uh you know deep relationship uh between uh people who know exactly you know their domain you know domain journalism and audiences and their content 
and actually us as data scientists who try to help them, you know, making uh, things easier uh, in the newsroom. But we always need this uh, very close collaboration, right, between between data science and uh, and journalism. And if we don't have this understanding, right, between us, uh, so it's not going to work. So that's that's why it's really cultural change uh, indeed. So I absolutely, absolutely agree with Mark. Um, well, let's break down, you know, let's break down AI a little bit now and how it's working in newsrooms. But um, before we do that, I just want to remind um, everyone you can put any questions into the Q&A box, which you'll find down the bottom at any time. Um, I'll ask a couple more questions and then we'll open it up. And um, please feel free to ask away. Um, so, yeah, let's get to this buzzword of the recent years, AI. It's been, it's been broadly used in media as an umbrella term for a range of technologies such as automated statistical data analysis, machine learning and natural language processing. Um, but we were just talking about, you know, I'd say both of you are also arguing in some respects, maybe it shouldn't be such a buzzword or, you know, I know that you've mentioned, Anna, that, you know, you think we're living a bit around, around a bit of hype at the moment uh, with this word and there are some limitations for now around what we can do. Uh, can you talk about those advances and limitations and how is it actually working in newsrooms at the moment? You, Anna, did a, a project last year called, um, it was the Extracting Quotes project you did at The Guardian. You know, what lessons did you take from that and what, what's happening now in newsrooms? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, um, AI, it's, I, I honestly think that sometimes it doesn't help, um, you know, with this cultural change that we are talking about uh, using this term because um it's uh it's very it's very vague uh and quite often what um people think about when you when you say ai it's just like something very perfect working machine that can make decisions you know for you etc cetera, etc cetera. this is not what we are doing in the newsroom to be honest you know we just we are doing a little bit of you know we are we are doing a lot of statistics uh, with uh, a little bit of machine learning and, you know, sometimes uh, a little bit of deep learning, but it's mostly uh, about using uh, advanced uh, techniques in natural language processing, for example, etc. So this kind of stuff. Um, and as I mentioned already, uh, we are not, um, you know, I kind of at this point, I don't think that we are there yet in terms of uh, making uh, all these decisions automatically by an algorithm, right? So uh, especially when we are talking about uh, user facing, um, you know, products, and uh, we obviously, we really want, uh, you know, humans to to check that, you know, what, what the algorithm is doing is, you know, is, is okay. And actually, going back to the point, uh, I thought that it was a very, uh, very interesting example from from my personal experience about uh, the perception of um, AI. Uh, and uh, some sometimes it, what what I see quite quite often uh, is that people expect uh, AI be one hundred percent accurate, right? So it's you know this argument that you know humans also make mistakes and the machine can make mistakes you know it's just about balancing the risks right and uh, and what what is acceptable you know what kind of threshold of uh, uh, the uh, you know these errors uh, is is acceptable so i remember that uh, at the bbc um, we had uh, this famous pro project called 5050 when we try to uh, look really, you know, kind of uh, at the diversity and representation of um, in our content, uh, who we talk to, you know, who we interview on air, etc. So we didn't have at that time any uh, automation in in this space. Uh, so what we asked uh, journalists uh, is to do very boring, mundane, manual task, basically inputting into Excel spreadsheet, right? <laughs> Every single person they interviewed, or every single person uh, which appeared even online in our online uh, output. Um, and when we were doing this in the newsroom, uh, at the same time, I was building some automation, right? So I had, I, uh, you know, wrote an algorithm and uh, which was able to predict uh, gender, for example, we were looking at gender. 
Um, and uh, I was blessed because for three months uh, I was running my script. And at the same time, people manually were, you know, like inputting this data. So yeah, I basically had this uh, ground truth, you know, <laughs> data set uh, manually curated by journalists. And when I started looking at, uh, you know, where um, humans uh, didn't agree with uh, with my output, with uh, uh, with the machine kind of uh, uh, output, there were a lot of mistakes in these spreadsheets, right? <laughs> So it's not like, you know, it's, uh, and I remember that this realization when I went to journalists, right, and we had an honest conversation, and I and I showed them, well, you know, this is, you know, this is not right, you know, and you miss this name, and you miss that name, etc. right, so it's this realization, and I remember that at this point, the exception, right, in the newsroom was much, much, you know, wider, so because, you know, we really, you know, people on the ground, you know, they just understood, you know, what, what it takes, actually, what it takes from them, what it takes from the machine, right, to, 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 to do it right. Uh, so this kind of, you know, this kind of experiments are super, super important, because we, um, it's, uh, it's also about thinking, uh, you know, about risks, for example, right, and impact. I read a, a very interesting um, uh, paper uh, from Nordic AI, and I really like very simplistic way of looking at uh, all, you know, like AI projects that we uh, we might work on, with you know, with risk on one axis and impact on the other. So you always have to think about where your project sits, right? So is it high risk? Uh, is it low risk? Uh, so if it, it's if, if it's low risk, so what kind of impact? And what you have to think about in terms of, you know, um, I don't know, uh, ethics and uh, everything else at this point. Uh, and again, we need journalists to work uh, with us on this. At, that, at this point, Anna, um, I might, because you've raised ethics, and of course you were just talking about experimentation as well, but um, I can see, I was about to ask a question on ethics, and I can also see one of our attendees has asked uh, a similar question. So I'll just read it out. Um, and yeah, let's just combine them. So an attendee asks, uh, asks, what sort of ethical concerns should we have around the rise of AI in newsrooms, considering broader social concerns around fake news or disinformation? And how can we stop AI impacting um, the ethics of news um, yes, because we've, you know, there are issues of erosion of privacy or problems with consent. I know you both have some um, things to say on this. And we can start with um, what either one of you. <laughs> I don't know, we, I can, I can, yeah, uh, I can talk a little bit about, you know, how I see this. Uh, it's interesting, we... You know, at the Guardian, we don't collect any demographics data, so we don't use demographics data in any of our models. Um, and that was a, you know, a kind of <laughs> informed decision that we <laughs> decided to make at some point. Uh, we might review this, uh, you know, going going forward. But all these issues around consent and you know what kind of data we can we can use in our uh, models and we cannot use. Obviously, you know, we. We take this uh, very, very seriously. But if you think about, um, you know, what you know, what else we have to think uh, in the newsroom, and we, as a society, I just don't think that we are there yet in terms of proper regulation of this space. It's very new. Uh, we are just kind of, you know, testing the waters, and I don't think that. Um, we we have a proper framework for uh, testing, um, you, you know, all these models uh, which are like you know out there around, uh, and scrutinizing the, the you know them properly. So what I really like to see, and we have already some you know, so journalists are doing their bit in this space because we have some very interesting initiatives when uh, journalists scrutinize uh, you know algorithms uh, which especially. Uh, when they uh, impact uh, people directly, but even to do this, right? We have so you know it's it's a it's a new field for journalism, right? So uh, we we again we need new skills. We need uh, this really deep understanding of uh, how it works. 
um, and I want to see this more and more because uh, indeed the, the risks are very uh, very high with fake you know with fake news and disinformation we know that with GPT free or whatever you can create multiple multiple copies of uh, uh, you know fake news kind of content and disseminate it uh, very very effectively this is basically what happened in 2016 right um so we have to we have to uh have an answer um and we have to you know uh, do our bit mark anything to add to this um no yeah i, I totally uh, agree of course anna and 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 i want i also want to recognize the work that you and your team and 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 so many journalists and so many news organizations are already doing right we're, we're not doing this panel to say journalists needs to do this thing because nobody's doing it and that's certainly not not what this is about in fact I don't think there's any news organization in the world that isn't one way or another uh, invested in this space and and trying to come up with solutions and everything. It's it's just that, I mean, from my perspective, uh, privileged perspective as an academic, uh, I would like to see that the initiatives undertaken by news organizations start from a sort of creative and an imaginative space rather than a space of fear or having to respond or or or, or those kind of things. And 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 to the ethical part, I mean, let's maybe rephrase this debate. At least I'm going to take that chance a little bit to say, like, so what could a news organization do ethically with AI? Well, one thing AI is really good at is content analysis. So you can run an AI through your, the content of your own news, like your entire archive of everything you've ever done, to see where the gaps in your own coverage are. Like, what do you overcover and what do you undercover? What kind of voices do you uh, allow in and which one do you systematically ignore? Uh, um, when do you interview women and what do they get to say in your TV show, in your, in your newspaper? I mean, that is the kind of simple stuff that AI can do really, really well and fairly quickly. And, and that is the beauty of AI, right? I mean, you run the analysis, you don't have to hire an expensive academic and pay their students to do this for you. <laughs> and, and, and you can quickly identify gaps in your own coverage and address them. Like the, so it's it, a, a, another example. Um, there is much debate about algorithmic personalization, right? Is that by knowing user data, you can really offer them a customized experience with your product or service, including your news uh, uh, offerings. But that's where there's real problems, right? It assumes that the data we gather from people's clicks and time spent and so on actually says something about what they need or what they want. And there's no real correlation between these two things. Uh, I mean, the, all the, the 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 qualitative, the anthropological, the ethnographic research out there suggests that clicks don't for people are not the same as quality. So so uh, so to be incredibly careful about using algorithmic personalization in 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 news, and and so so there's a couple of things that we can do with AI that would instantly, in my in my opinion, or potentially improve what journalists are already doing and the hard work that journalists are already are doing. And, and then when it comes to disinformation and fake news and so on, that it's a different kind of discussion, but it's an interesting one, the role that AI plays in that, both in amplifying, for lack of a better term, shit, <laughs> as well as um, offering opportunities. For example, uh, an example would be modular, modularjournalism.com, right? It's an AI service that that breaks up journalistic stories and then inserts them tactically into ongoing discussions on different online platforms right and that is an interesting use rather than employing 50 content managers in your news organization that have to figure out what part of this should be on TikTok, what should be on twitter what should be on mastodon what should be right and how and and copy paste or tail no you can do an a you can program an ai to do that for you and that service is already in the market. So there are some really interesting applications of AI that actually allow journalists to be more ethical in what they're already are doing. Yeah, actually, I agree. Maybe I can add uh, a little bit of uh, skepticism <laughs> but not, uh, about limitations, right? So and what kind of limitations we, we, we might have. 
it, it was a very interesting experience actually for me twice, uh, you know, once at the BBC and then, uh, you know, in the Guardian. When we, when we tried to segment our content from um, you know a different perspective. So basically, we had uh, this idea of uh, users' news needs. Probably you know um, people know about this segmentation, like update me, um, I don't know, divert me, etc. So we had uh, uh, the pioneered this segmentation at the BBC for World Service first, and then it moved to BBC News. And when I was at, you know working with the BBC News, uh, we decided, okay, well let's actually build. Uh, a model which can predict, uh, you know, the segment for each piece of content. But before before that, we uh, we thought, okay, we have to before you know start building, you know, the training data set because it's a hugely, uh, you know, tricky problem and time consuming. It's a manual task, etc. So um, my colleague and I we spent a couple of days. Uh, annotating the same uh, the same list of uh, uh, articles, um, you know, we were sitting in two different news uh, you know rooms, <laughs> not talking to each other, and then we decided to see you know how many times we actually labeled the same piece of content in the same way, and uh, we barely reached thirty percent. So only in thirty percent uh, you know cases we we actually labeled uh, uh, the piece of content in the same way. So there are some very subjective uh, concepts that when you try to, you know, automate them or, you know, like uh, making something, um, uh, you know, beyond kind of, you know, this uh, manual and mundane task, it, they just don't work. And we had another go at the Guardian when, uh, you know, we were thinking about contextual kind of advertising, etc. And again, it didn't work. So we just ran a couple of experiments, you know, we run tests and as soon as you even, you know, you add more and more annotators, for example, in your uh, data set. So the agreement goes down, you know, very, very quickly. So that's, I mean, <laughs> if some, you have to, you have to be very careful, um, you, you know, kind of uh, framing your problem um, because, you know, uh, asking the right question, it's probably one of the main, building blocks in 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 building AI and again you know back to this you know cultural change and why we need journalists to understand AI and you know like uh be because who else is going to ask these questions right so so we, we you know we have to ask right questions to be able to build these data solutions uh, for for the newsroom and this is where it plays you know uh, together very uh, very importantly um I can see a question actually in <laughs> In the, in the chat, I don't know if we want to address. Can see, um, well, we've actually got yeah, we've got a few questions. I might. Which one are you thinking about, Anna? Because I've got two that I was going to combine. Um, but but it, it actually, has, whatever you think. <laughs> um, so, you know, one one question is about how does AI technologies shape the future of news, uh, the news industry and media industries, and there's another question that's come in also which is really going to the paper as well about um, how we move from reacting to the inevitable AI to creating imaginative approaches with AI um, that serves journalists and public journalism. Um, you know, you've already brought up some examples in the last, um, you know, 10 minutes or so, but, uh, you know, is there anything you want to add in terms of what imaginative examples do you take inspiration from? Is it an ongoing, it's obviously an on, ongoing conversation, um, or how do you see it shaping the future of news? Um, Mark, maybe if you want to start. Yeah. And we will have to wrap up soon, so it may be the last question, we might get one more in. <laughs> Well, beyond mentioning a bunch of things, I mean, I, I do want to acknowledge um, uh, the work that my co-author Charlie Beckett is doing with the Journalism AI Initiative at the London School of Economics. And if you go to that website, you'll find a lot of reports and including a bunch of examples uh, from around the world of news organizations either developing their own or partnering with tech companies or with startups doing like really fun, innovative uh, uh, projects or, or developing specific services. And look, I mean, AI can be on the front end as something that we can see a news organization do, but it can also be something that works in the background. 
right? But that that that, uh, for example, uh, uh, there, there are numerous com smaller companies around the world that do because AI needs to be trained, right? And this is a huge industry, the software as a service industry, and that industry generally doesn't really care about journalism and is notoriously poor in uh, in 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 using up to date data right they use old massive data sets to train ai applications so there's companies now moving into that space that are actually specialized in journalism right that that, that and and so that's interesting uh, so those are i find really interesting applications and 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 the reason why i mentioned this it speaks to uh, what anna is also saying is that Thinking critically and creatively, imaginatively, imaginatively about AI also includes the, the 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 realization that every single aspect of journalism is touched by AI. Not just the content, not just the production, not just the, the visualization, but also what happens at the back end. Also, how you get an idea. Like if you get an idea for a journalistic story by scrolling on Mastodon or Twitter, you already are interacting with AI. Right. So and and to think creatively about how that impacts you and your work and to then start playing with it. I mean, that is you know, that's next level. <laughs> but that, that that I think that's really the kind of the conversation that we should be having rather than a conversation. Will AI make journalism obsolete or something like that? Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Um, and I think that we, you know, we uh, indeed uh, have so many use cases for, for this already. Uh, but uh, I still think that if we uh, look at the future, right, um, so there will be more and more systems that just help uh, newsroom uh, be more creative and spend uh, less time on this mundane kind of, you know, very boring tasks, but actually uh, spending more time on uh, creativity and finding new sources of information and obviously you know the investigative journalism uh, already is benefiting a lot uh, from uh, some sort of uh, automation because you know all this extraction of named entities or whatever you know helps us at least you know to flag you know some some stuff very quickly for for journalists um, so yeah it's uh, you know a huge potential there uh, but I, I, I'm uh, less uh, kind of optimistic or, you know, more skeptical, I would say, uh, about uh, all this, you know, uh, I don't know, um, user facing products, uh, um, which really serve the purpose of uh, explaining people what's going on around them. I still think that <laughs> we need journalists to do, to do their work properly. <laughs> So there will be, you know, a long time before we we actually uh, get there, if if ever, to be honest, if ever. Um, but yeah, that's uh, that's an amazing space to be in uh, right now. I would say that's that's for sure. <laughs> it's for sure. Um, okay, we'll just we will wrap up now. I'm just going to read out the the three questions that have been hanging here, and I might just leave it to the panelists to choose which one you want to answer. Um, we have. Where have best practice examples happened? Which news outlets or journalists or newsrooms are integrating AI well? Well, Anna, we know that what you think about that. <laughs> Obviously, no. But um, another question is, what is the impact of AI in countries where press freedom is extremely limited? Russia, for example. Um, and the last question that's hanging is, what would be some of the most in-demand skills for journalists in the future in terms of AI, um, you know, might possibly, will be, you know, to take the place of doing the basic work like article conduction? So, look, I leave it to you two to talk about whatever of those three that you might might want to. Maybe very quickly, the last one, because I think that, you know, I spent, uh, you know, many years in, in, in different newsrooms, right? And I remember that when, um, I don't know, 10 years ago, uh, even, yeah, just, just 10 years ago, uh, I had journalists in the newsroom who didn't even want to talk about numbers. So as soon as you start talking about numbers and just like, no, 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 we, you know, I'm a journalist, you know, I, I, I don't understand numbers, you know, just... Uh, uh, now we have journalists who actually uh, can code in Python, 
and I mean, <laughs> honestly, it's just, and it's not like, you know, they went to uh, some, you know, tech uh, um, uh, and, and studied tech, tech, tech subject or, or whatever, they just taught themselves you know how to make uh you know how to use all these tools and, and and they really realize that it helps them in their everyday life and we have more and more people like this in our newsroom and i i really think that uh, like you know honestly basic statistics i mean basic statistics we are not we are not talking about bayesian statistics or whatever but just understanding you know what is the difference between you know this and that and you know what what statistically significant means you know just just basics um, already will give you a huge uplift in terms of just understanding what's possible and how these systems work. So that's that's my advice <laughs> if, if you if you want to advance in this space. Mark, any anything you wanted to have a final say on any of those questions? Yeah, I, I would like to very briefly address the question about, you know, what about countries where there is limited or no press freedom, like Russia, for example. And 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 look, I mean, one thing we've seen since the start of the Russian of the war in, in Ukraine, or at least the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the war has been going on for quite a long time before that, but is is, you know, the incredibly high numbers of people in Russia installing VPNs and 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 going online that way uh, of uh, finding uh, like you also see happening in China, right? And 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 VPNs are also AI applications in one way or another, and the way they reroute traffic uh, um, and 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 so on and so forth, and use the data that. So your data still gets caught, get captured, but now not by all the sites that you're visiting, but by the VPN provider. And that data is then also put to use uh, for rerouting traffic, for example. So th that's an interesting example. And at the same time, uh, the fact that if you go online in Russia right now and you use TikTok, you see a completely different world than you use TikTok in Ukraine or in Latvia or, or in, in Poland. And that again reminds us that, ha, huh, AI is clearly not neutral, right? It can be deployed uh, along like physical geographic boundaries, apparently. And 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 um, and and that is a, a a great moment for digital literacy. It's like, oh yeah, we all use the same services, but apparently it matters from where uh, uh, we do this. And 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 that is like also a real that hopefully contributes to a broader insight that. Yeah, not, nothing of the information that we find online, nothing of the products and services we use is neutral, right? Not in terms of political bias, but algorithmic bias. And, and that's a great moment for literacy. And it's a, it's a topic that journalists should and are covering, should, and should cover and are covering. But, but uh, it's like Charlie and I say in the paper, like one of the ways in which AI matters to journalism is, is yeah, okay, exactly what Anna says, you, uh, to be literate about number, using numbers or reading numbers is, is certainly an issue. But, but also simply AI is a topic to appreciate that whether you cover elections and voting, you're covering AI. When you're covering the fashion industry, you're covering AI. When you, I mean, the music, I mean, everything AI these days touches. And that in itself is also a really interesting uh, perspective uh, on this that we haven't covered yet. But the, 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 the question about Russia for me highlights that. I think that's a great um, way to wrap up. We are over time. So um, hopefully, uh, yes, um, I, I'm not sure if we've lost. No, we're still going. Um, I just wanted to say, if we are still going, thank you uh, to our panelists who have been uh, very generous with their time, including Anna, of course, waking up in um, London and Mark from just landing in Perth. And, um, you know, I really hope that we've had a good discussion. I think, you know, it's part of many global discussions that are happening at the moment with journalism and AI, AI including the Journalism AI Initiative that we've mentioned a couple of times. Uh, so uh, again, we'll be back next year with the panel, with the salon, and hopefully continue bridging discussions between academia and industry and, um, and, and media in general. So thanks everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank Thanks, you. Anna. Thanks, Christine. Thanks, Cheers. Anna. Bye bye.